be hasty. I came down here for your coming of age with a nice, solid present to offer you. A junior partnership in the family business, 2,000 a year and a flat in town. No, thank you, Uncle John. Well, my dear chap, in three years' time, you'll take my place as Conservative candidate for Bargain. A safe seat and you'll carry on the family tradition. Awfully good of you, Uncle, but I've quite made up my mind. I want to be a pianist. No, Uncle. I think you went about that the wrong way. So it's my fault. I'm to blame. Would you mind if I suggested something? No, I won't. George is stubborn, big-headed. The more you try to stop him, the more he'll want to do it. If you give him a flat no and cut him off without a penny, he'll starve rather than give in. Well, what of it? Give him a fair chance. Make him a small allowance, enough to live on and pay his fees in Paris. Let him study there two years, on one condition. But at the end of two years, you must come back and let some competent, unprejudiced person hear him play. But what good would that do? Tell him that if that person says he shows real promise of becoming a first-class pianist, then he can go ahead. If not, he must abide by the decision and promise faithfully to give up all thoughts of making music his profession. Isn't that fair? What do you say, Uncle? Remember, you'll go whatever you say. Well, what can I say? Look, if he'll agree to the terms you suggested, all right. I'll give him five pounds a week to pay his fees and his lodgings. May I tell him you agree? What do you think, dear? I think Paul is right. All right. Hurry back and tell us what he says. We'll be in the hall. Come on, John, you've had quite enough. Come on, sweetie. George, I want to talk to you. It's no good, Paula. I've made up my mind. I know, but I persuaded your father to let you go. You what? He agrees to your going to Paris for two years, and he'll make you a small allowance. But at the end of that time, you've got to give it up, unless an expert says you've got a good chance of making a first-class pianist. What do you say? I say yes, of course. You're very sure of yourself? Well, I know I can do it. All right, I'll tell your father then. Paula, you've been absolutely wonderful. Thanks. Is that the best you can do? <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't be silly. I know you're not in the mood. George, there's no room for anything else in your life but music, is there? Well, at the moment, should I... All right, you needn't answer that one. Paul, I'm terribly fond of you. I'm not fond of you. I happen to love you. But I'll probably get over it. You needn't disown him. He agrees to everything. Two years in Paris, then an agreed judge to give the verdict. But it's definite he gives up his piano nonsense if the verdict goes against him. Yes. Good. When does he start? Tomorrow morning. Dites-moi, est-ce que Monsieur Georges Blain habite ici? Monsieur Georges Blain? Mm -hmm. Au troisième, au fond du corridor, la porte en face. Merci. George, how are you? Hello, Paula. Come along in. Well, this is it. Do you live alone here? Yes, I've got a woman who comes in twice a week to help me clear up. I get my own breakfast and lunch. Can you cook? <laughs> no. There you are, sit down. Thank you. Now, I just have bread and cheese and beer for lunch. I dine out with a couple of fellows who live around here. What are you doing over here? There's another month, you know. I know, I haven't come to drag you back. I had to go to Rome, and I promised your mother I'd look you up on my way. How is she? How's everybody? All right. They miss you, naturally. I think they rather expected you to throw it up in a month or so. Good Lord, no, it's hard work, but I love it. You got a good teacher? Yes, he's a bit hard to please, but he's good. Of course, the trouble is I only get sort of a couple of lessons a week, you see. The rest of it's all practice, ten hours a day. Are you satisfied? Hmm, I think so. Won't you play to me? Oh, well, you know, I'm a bit tired. I had rather a busy day today. Please. All right.
was no good. I'm not in the mood. I'll play for you in the morning. Sounded all right to me. No, I can play much better than that. George, there was something I wanted to tell you. It was agreed that someone should judge your playing when you come home next month. Through a friend of mine, I met Leah Mackhart. I've explained what happened. She's promised to come. But that's wonderful. Will you accept her judgment? Well, of course. She's the finest woman pianist in Europe. She's terrific. Of course, I've never actually met her, but I go to all her concerts. Um, do my father and mother agree? They think she's a bit too arty. They're scared she'll be too much on your side, but they agree. You'll explain that I'm only a beginner. I've told her everything. I know I can do it. I can feel it in my bones. George. Yes? I was just wondering what you'd do if you weren't able to carry on with your music. Well, I don't know. I've never even thought about it. It might be a good idea to have some other interest. Such as what? You never thought of falling in love. Yeah, yes. But that'll have to wait. Don't let it wait too long. Hello. Paul, I'm so glad you've come. Is the great lady here yet? Not yet. George has driven to the station to meet her. I didn't want him to. Why not? Well, the boy can be very charming when he wants to be too charming. I'm so afraid he'll persuade her to think he's a genius. Oh, I think she'll be fair. I do hope she thinks he's no good. It'll be such a relief to all of us. I'm afraid it'll be a terrible disappointment to him. Well, life's full of disappointments. One just learns to put up with them. Well, that sounds like the car now. Come along. Ah, oh, here's my mother now. Mother, this is Leah Market. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? And Paul, you know? Yes, of course. And this is my father. Oh. How do you do? How do you do? It was good of you to come. I was glad to. I'm always glad to help those who wish to play. You must find this a little odd. Not at all. You see, it seemed the only fair way. I mean, if he's any good, we can't stand in his way. And if not, well, it's better to be a first-class plumber than a second-class pianist. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> I was telling him in the car, he must be prepared for at least another five or six years' study. As much as that? Oh, yes. Madame Mackard suggests I go to Rome and study under her master. Ah, that's provided you're good enough, of course. Ah, of course. Uh, would you like some tea, madame? No, thank you. It's not one of my bad habits. <laughs> a little drink, perhaps? No, no, I have a concert tonight. So I cannot stay as long as I should wish. And then we'd better go in at once. <laughs> Where would you like to sit? May I sit here? Please do. Yeah. Well, now. We're all ready. falling in love. Yeah, yes, but that'll have to wait. Don't let it wait too long.
What exactly is it you wish me to tell you? Have I any chance of becoming, in time, a pianist of the first rank? Not in a thousand years. Of course, I can see that you've worked very hard and you have acquired technique and brilliance, but you lack the magic, the quality that is a combination of soul and fire without which no artist can reach the heights. I'm sorry, but your playing is square. If I thought you had in you the makings of an artist, I shouldn't hesitate to beseech you to give up everything for art's sake. Art is the only thing that matters. <laughs> in comparison with art, wealth, rank, power aren't worth that. But don't think your work has been wasted. It will always be a pleasure to play the piano and it will enable you to appreciate great playing as no ordinary person can hope to do. I don't think that you can ever hope to be anything more than a very competent amateur. And I don't need to tell you that in art, the difference between the amateur and the professional is immeasurable. But don't take my opinion alone. After all, I'm not infallible. Ask someone else. That won't be necessary. I'm quite content to accept your verdict. It was very good of you to come down to judge me, especially while you're so busy. Would you do one more thing for me before you go? What is it? Would you play to me? I'm afraid I must go now. That was a very great pleasure. 
Come in. Hello. George. It's all right. Don't get any ideas into your head. I'm cleaning it. If I've got to become a country gentleman, I might as well get some practice in. The others have gone over to the cricket. Won't you come? No, I don't think I will, thanks. We shouldn't be indoors on a lovely day like this. No, I know. I'll go out for a stroll later on. Shall I wait and come with you? No, I... All right, darling. I know how you feel. George? Mm-hmm? You remember what we were saying in Paris about having some other interest? Yes. Don't let it wait too long. I won't. As I told you at the opening of this inquiry, a majority verdict is sufficient from you. Now, you've heard all the evidence. If you wish to retire to consider your verdict, you may do so. There'll be no need to retire, sir. We had a talk during the recess, and we're agreed. Unanimous. We're of the opinion, sir, that the young gentleman shot himself accidental. He must have been cleaning his gun, not knowing he'd left it loaded from the end of last season. As to that business about the music, sir, we don't attach much importance to that. A young gentleman of Master George's position, sir, would never go and shoot himself just because he couldn't play the piano good. Thank you. The Kite. I know this is an odd story. I don't understand it myself. And if I set it down in black and white, it's only with a faint hope that when I've written it, I may get a clearer view of it. Or rather with the hope that some reader, better acquainted with the complications of human nature than I am, may offer me an explanation. It was told me one evening by my friend Ned Preston. Ned was a prison visitor. He took his duties very seriously and made the prisoner's troubles his own. Come in. Mr. Preston, sir. Oh, hello, Preston. Hello. Didn't expect you until tomorrow. Sit down. Thanks. Yes, I'm a day early. I've got a conference at the Home Office tomorrow. Anything for me? Well, here are the new arrivals. Oh, and Soames gets out tomorrow. Ah, yes, I'll have a word with him. I'll see these others, too. Anything else? Yes. I'd like you to see number 142, name of Sunbrae. Well, what's he in for? Well, it's a queer case. I'd rather you saw him first, see what you make of it. 142, Sunbury. 142, Sunbury. This is him, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And my name is Preston. I'm what they call a prison visitor. Oh, yes. Why don't you sit down? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I can't offer you a fag or a glass of beer. That's all right. Lovely day it's been. Yes, it's been very nice. Just the right sort of wind. Steady northwest. Gusty enough to make you watch it, but not strong enough to tear things up. Tear what up? Hmm? Oh, nothing. Uh, what, what can I do for you, mister? 
That's what I can do for you, Sombre. That's what I've come to see you about. As I understand it, you've left your young wife and you refuse to provide for her. That's right. But you can't let her starve. Why not? Why not? Good heavens, man, what's she done to deserve that? She's done something I'll never forgive to my dying day. What was that? She smashed my kite. She what? She smashed my kite. <laughs> that seemed to be a queer thing for the boy to say. So I said, what's she ever done to harm you? And he said, she smashed my kite. That's right. What, you knew about it? <laughs> yes, he told me the same thing. Said he'd been interested in kites ever since he was a kid of seven or eight. And his parents took him for a walk on the common one Saturday afternoon. There were plenty of kites up that day, more than he'd ever seen at one time before. And they fascinated Herbert. And according to Mr. Sunbury, a new kite flying club had just been started around there and was becoming very popular with the locals. And the more he watched, the more Herbert was certain that nothing would give him greater pleasure in this world than a kite of his own. So he broached his mother on the delicate subject and was told that if he was a good boy and brushed his teeth regularly every morning, he might get a surprise at Christmas. The thrill of that first kite was something Herbert never quite forgot. He couldn't get out to flight fast enough. Well, you know how it is. Some kids collect butterflies or postage stamps. Some are mad about fretwork. Well, Sunbury flew kites. In fact, it became a sort of passion with him and his parents. Herbert, aren't you going to come and have your tea? Eh? Oh, yes. Sorry, Mum. What are you doing? I'm designing a new kite. Designing one? Show us. Now, I reckon if we could build a kite like this, only about six feet long, we could lick anything else on the common. It's a queer shape, isn't it? Well, that's the idea. So it'll take the wind. Here and here. See? Why don't you make it, Herbert? Eh? Oh, it, it'll cost a bit. How much? Oh, about five pounds, even if we built it ourselves. Well, I don't mind springing hole. Getting extravagant, aren't you? Not at all. If Herbert's got a brilliant new design, it's up to us to back him up. I could manage 30 shillings. No, you don't need to find anything. You just do the work and your father and I'll find the cash. You will? Beatrice. It's all right. I've got a little put aside. Now, you get started on it right away. Tea's ready. All right, Mum, just coming. How's it going on? Pretty well. We've just finished the first drawing. We'll be able to start construction next week. Well, you'd better come and have your tea now. Right, oh, Mum. Oh, Mum, I've asked a young lady to tea tomorrow. Is that all right? You've done what? I've asked a young lady to tea. Who is she? Her name's Baker, Betty Baker. I met her at the pictures. She was sitting next to me. She dropped her bag and I picked it up and she said thank you, so naturally we got talking. And you fell for an old trick like that? Dropped her bag indeed. Oh, no, you're mistaken, Mum. She's a nice girl, really, she is. Well, when did all this happen? Oh, about three months ago. Oh, you met her three months ago and asked her to tea tomorrow. Oh, I've seen her since, of course. See, on that day, I asked her if she'd come to the pictures with me on the Tuesday, and she said she didn't know. Perhaps she wouldn't, perhaps she wouldn't. But she came all right. Of course she did. I could have told you that. Oh, look, Mum, I don't want to force her on you. If, if you. if you don't want her to come to tea, I can tell her you don't feel very well and take her somewhere else. You do as you please. I've no patience with you. What's the matter with her? She'll be all right when she gets used to the idea. She doesn't like strangers, that's all. My dear, quite a spread. I wasn't going to let her think we was just nobodies. I wonder what she'd be like. Need you ask? Oh, I don't know. Herbert's got his head screwed on the right way. No, since he's just a child. Any designing chit of a girl could twist him round her little finger. Well, we'd better wait and see. We won't have to wait long. Here they are. Well, just a sec. Let's see if I'm all right. How do I look? Fine. This is Betty, Dad. Pleased to meet you, Betty. Come inside. This is Betty, Mum. 
Miss Baker, I presume. And that's right. But you can call me Betty. I think the acquaintance is a little short for that. Won't you sit down, Miss Baker? Thank you. Samuel, dear, will you ask Miss Baker if she'll have some bread and butter or a piece of cake? And both, Miss Baker. I like to see people eat hearty. Tea, Miss Baker. Thank you. Milk and sugar? Yes, please. Two lumps? Thank you. Thank you, dear. Oh! Oh, I am sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter at all. I'll give you another piece. Don't bother, please. I'm sure the floor's quite clean. I should hope so. But I wouldn't dream of letting you have some cake that's been on the floor. I don't really want any more. Really, I don't. I'm sorry you don't like my cake. It tastes all right to me. Oh, it isn't that. It's just that I'm not hungry. I never have a big tea. I'm down for a fag, Bert. A cigarette for Miss Baker Herbert. Mm. We prefer to call our son Herbert Miss Baker. I know. When he told me his name was Herbert, I nearly burst out laughing. Fancy calling anybody Herbert. <laughs> Proper scream, I call it. I think it's a very nice name, but of course it all depends on what class of people one is. If you see what I mean. Why don't you sit down and stop worrying? How can I, when I think of Herbert being mixed up with a girl like that? Oh, I don't know. She's a pretty little thing in her way. Pretty my foot, all that powder and paint. She looked very different with her face washed and without a perm. Common, that's what I call her. Common as dirt. There he is now. Don't go upsetting him. I think I know how to treat my own son, thank you. What's the matter with you? What do you think? I'm fed up. Now, Herbert, you didn't ought to talk to your mother like that. Well, she shouldn't treat Betty like that. Like what? You know what I mean. I do not know what you mean, Herbert. And all I have to say is that I'm surprised that a son of mine should insult his mother by bringing a woman like that into the house. Well, what's wrong with Betty? Would you like me to tell you? Yes. She's common and cheap, cheap as dirt. You've no right to say that. I have a right to say what I like in my own house. And let me tell you this, she's never going to set foot in this house again, not if I know it. Oh, well, before you start saying that, you may as well know I'm engaged to her. You're not. I've been thinking about it for a long time, and she was so upset tonight, I felt sorry for her, so I popped the question. I had a rare job persuading her, I can tell you. <laughs> you fool. You fool. Herbert, 20 past. Just coming. You'll miss your train. I wish I could get Saturday mornings off. You will when you're my age. You off, Herbert? Yes, Mum. I'll make dinner half past one, then we can have a nice afternoon's flying. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I shan't be coming this afternoon. Why not, Herbert? I'm going to see the rooms. What rooms? For Betty and me. What do you want rooms for until you're married? Oh, we're getting married the week after next. I found a half a house in Dabney Street and I'm furnishing it out of my post office savings money. Oh, no, Herbert, oh no. Oh, come on, Mum, don't take it so hard. Things will never be the same again. Of course they will. You'll like Betty once you get to know her. She's a nice girl, really she is. You must just give her a chance. We can still go on flying our kite on Saturday afternoons, just like we always did. Well, Betty can't see anything in kite flying yet, but she'll come round to it. Even if she doesn't, I'll come. If you marry that woman, Herbert, you'll never fly the new kites of there. Why not? It's mine, isn't it? You gave it to no, me. No, no, I never did. I said we'd put up the money if you did the work. I didn't say anything about giving it to you. All right, then. You can keep it. Betty says kite flying's a kid's game anyway, and I ought to be ashamed of myself flying a kite at my age. She's quite right. Hello, Dad. Hello, Herbert. Have a good honeymoon? Oh, fine, thanks. Sorry about the wedding, son. I'd have come all right. See no reason for making more trouble in the world when there's enough already. But you know what your mum is. I know. I'm sorry, too. How are you settling in? All right. How, how's everything at home? All right. We miss you. You still fly on Saturday afternoons? Yes. It isn't the same, of course, without you. But we try and keep the old spirit going. I wonder you don't buy a kite of your own. You were always so keen on them. I know, but Betty doesn't see nothing in it. Well, the guy costs money. Shan't be long, Betty. 
Where are you going, Bert? Just for a walk to get some fresh air. You won't be late, will you? I don't want to miss the start of the picture. OK. I'll have tea ready sharp at five. All right. No good. I'll never get it to fly. Have just one more try. I can't. I'm puffed out. We need Herbert on a job like this. I say, don't look now. Pretend you're packing up the kite, but do you see what I see? Where? Over there, under the trees. It's Herbert. Yes, pretend you haven't seen him for the moment. What's the idea? Try the kite once more. And this time, see you end up over there by the trees. It's no good. It won't work. We can but try. I tell you, I'm puffed out. Do you want me to do it? No, of course not. I'll manage. So you finished it, eh? Hello, Herbert. Yes. I had it made exactly like your design, but it doesn't work. There's something wrong. Oh, it's as clear as daylight. What's wrong? Oh, what? You've got it rigged too low. There, now try it. I can't, Herbert. I'm puffed out. Give it to me. What did you expect? Well, you've been having a bit of trouble with it, haven't you? That's only because it's experimental. This is only a small scale model, you know. Once we got this right, we're going to build a big one, six feet long. We reckon that'll go up two miles. Two miles? You don't say so. It'll be a huge thing, you know. You won't be able to fly it yourselves. We never thought of flying it ourselves. You'll have to lend a hand, Herbert, at least until it's proved itself. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll lengthen it just here, see? And lighten it just there. Where's another drawing, Dad? Here. Wait a minute, I'll put the light on. It's getting a bit dark. Hey, what's the time? It's after seven. Hey? Oh, gosh, I can't stop now. I'll come and talk to you about it next week. But, Herbert... Sorry, Dad, I'll have to go. Goodbye. finally got back. I'm sorry, Betty. I didn't realise it was so late. We missed the start of the big picture. You know that, don't you? I'm terribly sorry. Really, I am. Well, where have you been? No, I, I just met some fellows and we got talking. What fellows? Oh, just some chaps, I know. Why don't you tell me the truth? You were on the common flying that kite, weren't you? No. Don't lie to me, Bert. I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. I followed you today and saw what happened. Flying a kite, you were. You, a grown man. Contemptible, I call it. Well, I don't care what you call it. I like it. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. I tell you straight, I won't have it. I'm not going to have you make a fool of yourself. I've flown kites on Saturday afternoons ever since I was a kid, and I'm going on flying them as long as I want to. It's all that mother of yours. You went back there this afternoon, didn't you? Suppose I did. She's just trying to get you away from me, that's all. If you were a man, you'd never speak to her again, not after the way she's treated me. She's my mother, and I've every right to see her just whenever I want to. Oh, Bert, why do we have to quarrel about a silly kite? I didn't want to quarrel. It was just I was so lonely sitting here all that time waiting for you to come in. I'm sorry, Betty. I didn't mean to be late. Honest, I didn't. It won't happen again. Oh, Bert, I do love you so. <laughs> Hello, Herbert. Hello, Dad. I haven't seen you lately. No. Lovely flying weather we've had these last two Saturdays. We looked out for you. I took Betty to the pictures. Betty, 
wasting a fine Saturday afternoon in the pit. Well, she likes to go on Saturday afternoons. The new kite came today. It did? We had it built at Martin's, just the way you designed it. How does she look? Grand. Your mum says, of course, we'd like you to come and help us with it. But no one's got a right to come between a man and his wife. And if you're afraid of Betty, her kicking up a rumpus, I mean, you better not come. There's a young fellow on the common, Bill Perkins, you know. He's just mad about it. He says he can fly it if anyone can. What does Bill Perkins know about a kite I designed? Well, your mum and I can't manage it alone. We must just take the best help we can get, that's all. You think it over, and if you don't come, we'll understand. Well, what would you like to see? There's Margaret Lockwood at the Palace and John Mills at the Majestic. Hey, look, Betty, couldn't we go to the second show after tea about six? Why? Well, it's a lovely day. It seems a pity to sit inside in the dark when the sun's shining outside. Why don't you stop lying and tell me the truth? It's that kite, isn't it? Supposing it is. But, Bert, you promised me three weeks ago you wouldn't make a fool of yourself with that kid's game again. So I know, but well, this happens to be a special kite, one I designed myself for Mum and Dad. They've been flying kites for years. Why can't they do it themselves? Because it's too big, till I show them how. And there's, there's more to it than that. It's a new idea. Everybody on the Commons excited about it. If it's successful, I'll patent it and make a lot of money out of it. <laughs> That's a good one, that is. Make a lot of money out of kites. Now look, Betty, why don't you come yourself? It's good fun, really, it is. I told you why. Because I'm not going to have people laughing at me or at you, either. Well, I'm going. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. And sit here for hours alone. Well, if you don't want to come, that's your lookout. Well, I'm not coming, and that's flat. Look, Betty, just this once. That's what you say now. Once you start, it'll go on for years. I've had about as much of this as I can stand. Are you married to me or that darn kite? Well, if you don't want to come, you needn't. But you can't stop me going. We'll see about that. Come on, let me buy. It's me or that kind, I warn you. Do you want me to give you a sock on the jaw? If you go now, you needn't come back. I'll come back when I choose. I mean it. If you go now, you can go for good. Get out of my way. <laughs> oh, leave me alone! Leave me alone! It'll fly all right. You wait. Well, come on, let's see it. When my son comes, get he is now. My son Herbert designed it. Come on, Herbert. It's all ready. Dad, come. All right, Samuel, I'll answer it. Hello, Herbert. Uh, I've come home, Mum. Your room's ready for you. Take your things upstairs and then come down. We was just sitting down to supper. Samuel, run out and get a quart of beer. Herbert's come home. Well, you're out of it now, Herbert. I always said that she was no wife for you. It was her what done it, not me. Of course it was her. Well, it's all over and done with now. It'll be nice to sleep in your own little bed again, won't it? The bed you've been used to all your life. She'll try and get him back. <laughs> that chance she's got of that. 
course, you'll have to provide for me. Why should he? She trapped him into marrying her. Now she's turned him out of the home he made for her. I'll give her what's right as long as she leaves me alone. Well, good night, Mum. I'm tired. I'll be glad of a good night's rest. In your own nice, comfortable bed. Good night, Herbert, dear. Good night, Dad. Tomorrow's Sunday, so you needn't hurry to get up. I'll bring you a nice cup of tea in bed. Dear. Evening paper. Oh, what a lovely smell of toast. It's buns. Oh, it reminds me of them old days coming home from school and smelling toasted buns. The old days are back again, Herbert. Do you know what? It took me a week to get your clothes brushed and your socks mended. Oh, they wear in state. Now, you take your boots off, dear, and put your slippers on. I'll get your tea. No, I've got to go down to the post office before it shuts. I've just got time for a cup of tea. What are you going to the post office for? Oh, well, it's payday and Betty knows. I must send her something. Why should you? She's young and healthy. Let her go out and earn her own living. She threw you out. She can't expect you to work for her after that. He's got to do the right thing, Beatrice, whether it's due to her or not. We talked it over in the train, and I think he ought to send her, say, 35 shillings a week. That's her. Leave it to me. I'll see to her. Well? I want to see Bert. You can't. He's out. No, he isn't. He went in with his dad five minutes ago and he hasn't come out again. Well, he doesn't want to see you. And if you start making a fuss, I'll call the police. I want my week's money. That's all you've ever wanted of him. Here's 35 shillings. 35 shillings? But the rent's 12 shillings a week. That's all you're going to get. He has to pay his board and lodging here, hasn't he? And then there's the instalment on the furniture. We'll see to that when the time comes. Well, do you want the money or don't you? I want to see Bert. You can't. Now, there's your money. Now, be off with you. I settled her hash all right. Leave it alone. Don't answer. And don't let them buns get cold. Hello, Bert. Hello. I want to talk to my husband alone, Mr. Sunbury. There's nothing you have to say to me that my dad can't hear. All right, then. I want you to come back home, Bert. I didn't mean it that night when I packed your bag. I only did it to frighten you. I was in a temper. I'm sorry for what I did. Oh, it's also silly quarrelling about a kite. Well, I'm not coming back, see? When you turned me out, you did me the best turn you could have done me. Oh, Bert! You got my letter, didn't you? So long as you stay away from me, I'll send you a 35-shilling postal order every Friday night. And I'll pay the instalments on the furniture as they become due. It's a darn sight fairer than you deserve. Now I've got my train to catch. But I love you, Bert. If you want to fly a silly old kite, you can fly it. I don't care, just as long as you come back. No, thanks. I know when I'm well off. And I've had enough of marriage to last me a lifetime. I'll go. Yes? Oh, good evening. Uh, I'm from the advertiser. Could I speak to Mr. Sunbury? I am Mr. Sunbury. Uh, Mr. Herbert Sunbury? No, that's my son. What do you want with him? Oh, well, my editor wants me to write a piece about his kite. Uh, I, I gather it's something uh, quite new, isn't that right? Just a minute. I'll, I'll call him. Good, thanks so much. Herbert, there's a reporter here wants to talk to you about your kite. Oh, good evening. I'm sorry to trouble you, but my editor wants a few details about your new kite. It's no trouble. Uh, we've had a report that it's something rather special. It is. Good. Now, tell me, uh, how is it different from any other kite? It's the design. The design? Oh, yes, of course. It's, well, uh, could I see it? Yes, if you like. I'll go and get it. Thanks. Won't you step inside for a minute? Oh, thank you very much.
wish Herbert had come back. I don't like him rushing off like that. Well, he was upset. Wouldn't you have been? I only hope he doesn't do her a mischief. We don't even know it was her. Well, who else could it be? She must have watched me going out shopping and then slipped in the sideway. It's not so much the damage, it's, it's the adjustments. The weeks of work he put into it. Even if we built another, he might never get it right again. She did it all right. Told me straight out. Proud of it she was. She said she'd do it again if she got the chance. And well, what did you say? Oh, I didn't trust myself to say a word. I came away. And it wouldn't take much to make me wring her neck. Even if I had to swing for it. I know one thing, though. She's not going to get another penny out of me as long as I live. She'll take you to court. Let her. The instalment on the furniture's next week. In your place, I wouldn't pay it. Then they'll just take it away and all the money he's paid on it will be wasted. What of it? He's rid of her for good and we've got him back. And that's the chief thing. Oh, I don't care about the money. But I give all I've got to see her face when they come to take away the furniture. It meant a lot to her, that did. Oh, and that piano. Oh, she fair loved that piano. Well, of course, he didn't pay the instalment and he didn't pay her. And when the magistrate made an order, he didn't pay that either. So eventually, he landed up here. Well, I've talked to him, but I just can't get anywhere. What do you make of him? What's the girl like? Do you know? Not bad at all. I've seen her. No, there's nothing wrong with her, except that she's jealous of his kite. It must be something about kite flying. Something too deep for us poor laymen to understand. Yes, maybe. Though for the life of me, I can't see why. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps it gives him a sense of power to watch the thing he's made soaring up into the clouds. Or maybe in some queer way, he identifies himself with a kite. You know, escaping from the restrictions of life on Earth. Well, that's a bit fanciful, isn't it? Well, people are fanciful, much more than you'd think. But anyway, I can tell you this. To him, his kite represents an ideal of some kind. When once a man gets bitten by an ideal, not all the king's doctors, nor all the king's surgeons can do anything to cure him of it. Then what are you going to do about it? Nothing. That's the end of the story, as Ned Preston told it to me. And I never knew what happened to Herbert and Betty. Perhaps it was something like this. Mrs. Sumbry? That's right. I'd like to talk to you for a minute, if I may. What about? Your husband. Did, did he send you here? Uh, no, it was my own idea. My name is Preston. I'm what they call a prison visitor. Oh, you'd better come in. Uh, thank you. I've just seen your husband, Mrs. Sunbury. He's inside again, you know. Yes, I know. Seems it's rather a pity, don't you think? It's not my fault. No, 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 of course not. Nobody's suggesting it is. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Mrs. Sunbury, would you take him back? I don't know. Would you think about it? What's the point of thinking about it? He wouldn't come back, even if I asked him to. Well, but supposing he would, would you take him? Yes, I think so. Right. And I want you to... Colonel's Lady. The 
Peregrines were having breakfast. Though they were alone and the table was long, they sat at opposite ends of it. George Peregrine was, as usual, comfortably absorbed in his times when the butler brought in the morning post. Oh, tell Summers I shall want the car at 11. I'm going to the agricultural show. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, let me open it for you. You know I hate to see people cut string. Same. What on earth do you want six copies of the same book for? Hmm. Poetry. Though Pyramids Decay by E. K. Hamilton. E. K. That's your maiden name. You don't mean to say that you wrote it? Yes. What, poetry? Uh, yes. You never told me. You are a sly boots. I didn't think it would interest you very much. Would you, uh, would you like a copy? Well, uh, poetry's not much in my line, you know, but yes, I would like a copy. I'll take it to my study and look at it. Nicely got up. Quite like a real book. Must have cost you quite a bit to get this printed. I was lucky. I sent it to a publisher and he took it. In fact, he paid a small advance. Twenty-five pounds. You don't say. Really? Bless my soul. to see you, sir. Oh, show him in. Oh, good morning, Bannock. Good morning, Colonel. Well, I've got those forms for your new barn. There are some details you'll have to fill in. I put pencil crosses against the questions that you must answer. Thank you, sir. Have you got time to look at that bull, sir? Well, uh, no, not today, I'm afraid. I've got to be at the agricultural show at half past 11. And it's the county committee this afternoon. Well, if you're going by the lane, sir, it'll only take five minutes. <laughs> oh, all right. We'll have a look in on the way to the show. I'll have to be quick. Uh, thank you, sir. Come along. Good morning, Bannock. Good morning, madam. You off now? Uh, yes, I'm just going to look at this bull that Bannock wants to buy before I go on to the show. Will you be back for tea? Uh, no. It's the county agricultural committee. Look, uh, don't wait dinner for me if I'm late. No, all right, then. Oh, just a second. Uh, Evie. I, uh, I read your book. Already? Yes, got down to it right after breakfast. Didn't take long. <laughs> there isn't much of it, is there? No, not very much. <laughs> a bit of a swiss charging eight and six for that. Well, it's only 80 pages. Yes. <laughs> Did you like it? Hmm? Well, oh, yeah, jolly good. <laughs> not quite my stuff, you know, but jolly good. I'm glad you liked it, dear. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. George, how are you? Oh, I'm very well, thanks. We were only talking about you this morning. Or rather, about your wife. My wife? Yes. By Jove, what a success. I've never read such a notice for a book of poetry. Didn't know you read poetry. No, I don't myself. My wife does. She belongs to one of those book societies and gets all the new stuff. Yes. She got your wife yesterday. Read it in a sitting. Said it was magnificent, but, uh, well, hardly suitable for children, if you know what I mean. What the devil do you mean, sir? What do you think about it yourself? How do you know my wife wrote it anyway? Girl in Boots Library told my missus last week. Oh, it's in the telegraph today. I've just read it. 
Yes, here it is. The name of Catherine Hamilton conceals the identity of Mrs. George Peregrine of the Manor House, Langley, Warwickshire. She is the daughter of the late General Sir Richard Hamilton, who will be remembered for his gallant defence of Noreen in the Second Afghan War. <laughs> Not a mention of you, old boy. Seriously, what do you think of the book? Well... <laughs> do you know, I... I don't believe you've read it. If you were chairman of seven committees, president of three clubs, and goodness knows what else, you'd know why I don't get time for poetry. Hello, George. Hello, my dear. I began to think you weren't coming. I'm sorry, Daphne. I've had the dickens of a day. Been on the bench all morning. One of those beastly husband and wife cases went on for hours. I missed the train and had to come up on the four o'clock. Then you obviously need a drink. Well, what should we do? Would you like to have supper at Mario's and then go on to the Mill Royal? Mm, that'd be nice. But don't let's stay out too late. All right. Have you been? Lonely. I'm sorry. I just couldn't make it last week. I'm a busy man, you know. Too busy. Never mind. We'll make up for it tonight. All right. I'll give you. Oh, by the way, is it your wife who's written that book they're all talking about? What on earth do you mean? Well, a man I know, he's a critic, took me out to dinner the other night. And he had a couple of books with him, you know, review copies. So I asked him to give me one to read. But he said, oh, no, you wouldn't like these, they're poetry. Hmm. Well, I'm not much of a hand at poetry in the ordinary way, so I told him he could keep them. However, just as he was going, he seemed to change his mind, and he said, well, you might like to try this one. It's damn good, and it's selling like hot cakes. Do you know he was absolutely right? I just couldn't put it down. Who's it by? A woman called Hamilton. But my friend said her real name was Peregrine, and I said, well, that's odd, because I know some Peregrines, and it's not a very common name, is it? My friend said it couldn't be the same ones, because this woman was married to a colonel type who lived near Worcester. I'd just as soon you didn't talk about me to your friends. Oh, what do you take me for, darling? I just said, no, it can't be the same ones. My friend said he's supposed to be a regular Colonel Blimp. <laughs> well, you can tell them better than that, eh? <laughs> and if my wife had written the book, I should be the first to know about it, wouldn't I? Well, I suppose you would. Then let's not waste time on trifles. I've not seen him some time now. I heard the other day. He hadn't been too well. I hope he's all right. Ah, Peregrine. Uh, how do you like being the husband of a celebrity? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, it's no good, old boy. The secret's out. It's in today's telegraph. Amazing for a book of poetry to get reviews like that. Selling like hotcakes, they tell me. Peregrine. Forgive my butting in. I say, I have Henry Dashwood lunching with me. He heard you were here. He'd so much like to meet you. Who's Henry Dashwood? Good Lord, what do you do with yourself down in the country all the time? Henry Dashwood, only about the best critic we've got. He wrote a wonderful review for your wife's book in The Spectator. Come along, old man, you can't disappoint him. Henry, this is Kathleen Hamilton's husband, Colonel Peregrine Henry Dashwood. How do you do? I'm delighted. Is Mrs. Peregrine in London by any chance? I should so much like to meet her. Uh, my wife doesn't like London. She prefers the country. Oh, a pity. She wrote me a very nice letter about my review. I was completely bowled over by her book, you know. It's fresh and original, very modern, without being obscure. Yes, I suppose it is. She seems as much at home in free verse as in classical metre. In fact, I should go so far as to say that some of those short lyrics of hers might have been written by Landor. Really? But what makes the book so outstanding is the passion that throbs in every line. 
naked, earthy passion. Of course, deep, sincere emotion like that is completely tragic. Oh, my dear Colonel, how right Heine was when he said that the poet makes little songs out of great sorrows. You know, now and then, as I read and reread those heart-rending pages, I thought of Sappho. Well, it's jolly nice of you to be so nice about my wife's little book. I'm sure she'll be delighted. Idiot. Colonel Pedigree, is it? I wonder if you remember me. Of course. The Duke of Haverhill. <laughs> yes, we met last year, good boy. Yes, yes, I remember very well. We were so sorry your wife couldn't come to us for the weekend. We were expecting rather a nice lot of people. Uh, yes, yes, it is a pity. <laughs> Still, I suppose everybody's after her, so we can only say better luck next time. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Can I get you something, sir? Uh, no, thanks. I had some dinner on the train. Very good, sir. Uh, you can go to bed. Well, thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Wes. Good morning, sir. Good morning, George. How was time? All the same as usual. I just got the last train home. What is all this about our being asked to Heverell Castle and you refusing? I thought it would only bore you. Bore me? When we've never been asked before? Good heavens. And he's Lord Lieutenant of the county? Now, quite apart from his having the finest shooting for miles around? I didn't think of that. I'm sorry. I suppose I was asked. Well, as a matter of fact, you weren't. I think it's extremely rude to ask you without asking me. Well, I suppose they thought it wasn't your sort of a party. The Duchess is rather fond of writers and people like that, you know. Henry Dashwood, the critic, is going, and for some reason he wants to meet me. It was uh, nice of you to refuse, Evie. It was the least I could do. Oh, George, my publishers rang up yesterday. They're giving a little party for me on Wednesday, and of course they want you to come too. I don't think that's quite my mark, you know. Sounds a crashing bore. I would like you to come. We could go up to London in the morning and... Can't manage that, I'm afraid. Wednesday's the hunt committee, three o'clock. I couldn't be up to town until seven. Tell you what, you make a day of it, and I'll come up for the party. Oh, it would be sweet of you. Not at all. I've got to be in town on Thursday anyway. And it's remarkable. That should be surprised it's ready for a sixth edition. Well, we heard so. <laughs> Colonel Pedigree. Oh, yes. 
my name's Martin, your wife's publisher. I'm so glad you were able to come. Uh, I think Mrs. Peregrine's over here, sir. Yes. Thanks, I was looking for you know, we haven't had a success like this with a book of verse for 20 years. Very I've never good. seen such reviews. Oh, John, let me introduce Colonel Peregrine, Catherine Hamilton's husband, you know. This is Mr. John Coleman of our New York office. How do you do, sir? You must be a very proud man, Colonel Peregrine. Oh, yes. Yes, I am, of course. Well, this book of your wife's is something out of this world. It'll be a smash hit back home, too. It's the biggest thing we've handled in years. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, 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 wait. Uh, please. Are you really E.K. Hamilton's husband? You know, I think you're a very privileged person to be able to sit at the feet of such genius. I don't know when I've been so moved as I was by her book. I read it through twice at a single sitting, and now I never let a day pass without reading it at least once. Oh, really? How nice. How nice. Excuse me. Oh, yes, Colonel Peregrine. Oh, yes, my dear, I had to lock the door of my room when I read it. It made me feel quite naked, if you know what I mean. Well, I must say, I keep my copy locked up. I would like my husband to find it. I'd give him ideas. Well, that's what I find so fascinating. Apparently, her husband doesn't mind at all. Oh, but he must, surely. Oh, but he can't. He's actually here tonight. You're not serious. Yes, as a matter of fact, I've seen him. Johnny pointed him out to me. He's, uh... Oh, Colonel oh, Perrigan, I'm well, so pleased to have met you. How do you do? One minute, <laughs> You were wonderful, dear. You made quite a hit. The girls were raving about you. They thought you were so handsome. Girls? Old hags. You bored? Stiff. Oh, do you mind if we wait and go on the evening train tomorrow, Evie? I have a few things I want to do. No. That will suit me very well. There are one or two things I want to buy, and... I have to be photographed. Oh, I hate the idea. But they think I ought to be. For America, you know. Can I help you, sir? Hmm? Uh, no, I was just looking round. Oh, by the way, uh, have you got a book called Though Pyramids Decay? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're completely sold out. We're expecting a new edition any day now. Is there another edition, then? Yes, sir. The fifth. Might be a novel, the way it's selling. Uh, can I order you a copy, sir? Uh, yes, please. Colonel Peregrine, St. James's Club. Why do you suppose it's such a success? I've always been told that no one reads poetry. Well, this is good, you know. I've read it myself. It's the story they like. Sexy, but tragic. Hot stuff, but it's literature. I see. Of course, this is only a flash in the pan, if you know what I mean. The way I look at it, she must have been inspired by some personal experience, like Houseman with the Shropshire Lad. She'll never write anything else. Uh, look here. Uh, you needn't worry about that order. I think I know where I can borrow a copy. Well, George, I brought you the book. Is that all you wanted me for? Oh, no, Daphne, no. Of course not. Look, George, I'm awfully good at listening to husbands whose wives don't understand them. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was about the book. Mm -hmm. It was something a young chap in a bookshop said and something I noticed last night. What did he say? Something about it being sexy. Hot stuff. Well, isn't it? I... well, I... George, you don't mean to say you haven't read it. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, no. George, you're the end. You mean your wife can write the luscious book since Lady Chatterley and you don't even trouble to read it? Well, I... Look, Daphne, you've read it. Hmm. What's it about? Do you want me to tell you? Oh, well, no, really, George. I'd, I'd much rather not. You read it for yourself. Oh, please tell me. Let's go over there. Right. You're sure you want me to? Yes, please. Remember, you asked for it. So don't hold it against me afterwards. I won't. Well, it's... Um... Oh, thank you. 
Well, it's a sort of love story. Only it's all told in the first person, so you believe it's actually happening when you read it. Do you see what I mean? The person who's telling the story is a middle-aged woman married, and she falls in love with a younger man, much younger. When she first meets him, she likes him. She doesn't believe he could ever be interested in her. Well, not in that way. But one day, he tells her that he is, and asks her to leave her husband and go away with him. She's pretty much in love with him by this time. But she doesn't believe it can last, so she says no. This doesn't make any difference to the young man. He still keeps on seeing her. And soon they reach the stage when they can't do without each other. So they don't. She keeps telling herself it'll all be over in a few weeks. But it isn't. In fact, it gets worse instead of better. And soon they're meeting two or three times a week. In fact, whenever she can manage it without the husband knowing. And then, just when she's sure it's the real thing, and she's decided to go away with him, he gets killed. She just has to go on giving dinner parties and running the house as though nothing had happened. Well, that's all. Except it makes you feel that it's actually happening to you. It's so real. I don't mind telling you when I read it, I spent half the time crying and half the time getting into a state of... <laughs> well, you know what I mean. She must have made it up. Oh, read it and ask yourself whether anyone could have made it up. Evie's too much of a lady. She couldn't do a thing like this. Go. Aren't you going to finish your drink? Oh, I, don't, I don't want it, thanks. I, I'm sorry, Daphne. I must get away. See you now, sir. Hmm? Mr. Blaine will see you now. Oh, good. thanks, sir. Uh, hello, George. Hello, Harry. I've brought you here. Had a good time in London? Yes, thanks. Uh, I'm taking my missus up for a few days next week. How's Evie? Well, it's Evie I've come to see you about. Have you read her book? Yes. A great success, isn't it? Fancy Evie breaking out into poetry. Wonders will never cease. Which made me look a perfect fool. Nonsense. There's no harm in writing a book. Isn't there? Well, it's her own story. Who says it is? You know perfectly well that it is. And so does everyone else. I... I suppose that 
I'm the only one who doesn't know who her lover was. I wouldn't jump to conclusions. There's nothing to say she didn't make up the whole thing. I suppose she'd written a story about a murder. Would that make her a murderess? Look here, Harry. Be honest with me. Can you look me in the eye and tell me that you believe it's a made-up story? You've no right to ask me a thing like that, George. Ask Evie. I don't. Why not? I'm afraid she'd tell me the truth. Harry. Yeah? Who was the chap? I don't know. Well, if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Oh, I've got to know. I've got to. Look here. You have private detectives you employ, I suppose. It isn't a pretty thing to put detectives onto one's own wife. Well, it isn't a pretty thing for her to carry on an affair behind my back, is it? In any case, the man's dead. Well, how can I be sure of that? That may be the only untruthful part in the whole book. I've got to know, Harry. You must help me. I won't do it, George. Besides, if Evie found out you've been putting detectives onto her, she'd probably leave you. Do you want that? Well, no. Why should I? She runs the house perfectly. We never have any servant trouble. She's done wonders with the garden. And she's splendid with the village people. But how can I go on living with her when she's been so grossly unfaithful to me? You don't know that for certain. Then why on earth did she write the wretched book? I suppose she had some very poignant experience and it was a relief to get it off her chest. Then why didn't she have the sense to write it under an assumed name? She used her maiden name. I expect she thought that'd be enough. And it would have been if the book hadn't had this amazing vogue. What am I going to do, Harry? What would you do? Nothing. Nothing? But I can't overlook a thing like that. I've been made a laughing stock. Nonsense, old boy. Now listen. The man's dead. It all happened a long time ago. Forget it. Talk to people about Evie's book. Rave about it. Let them know how proud you are of her. The world moves quickly and people's memories are short. They'll soon forget. I shan't forget. Yes, you will. No, I shan't forget as long as I live. Well, I suppose you're right. It's no good crying over spilt milk. I'll take your advice. You know, the truth is, I don't know what I'd do without Evie. But there's one thing I shall never understand to my dying day. What in the name of heaven did the fellow ever see in her? I'm sorry you're angry about the book, George. If I'd known what would happen, I'd never have published it. What difference could that have made? Well, it would have saved you from being annoyed. Annoyed? <laughs> when a man learns that his wife has been unfaithful to him, but when she publishes to the whole world that she's carried on a degrading love affair behind his back, you expect him to be no more than annoyed. But, George... Evie, in 30 years of married life, we've never sunk to vulgar quarrelling. When this thing happened, I was stunned, amazed. These last few days, I've lived in a state of horror. And utter shame. Today, I decided that silence was the only decent and possible cause for me. But now that you've spoken, I shall speak. I'm entitled to ask one question and to receive a truthful answer. Who was this man and is he really dead? Because if... Who was he? For heaven's sake, tell me and I've done with it. It was you. Me? Yes. Don't insult me with lies. It was you. As you were. All those years ago in those happy days when we first met and you loved me. But you said in this book that he died. He did. The man who loved me died. It was my fault, George. I didn't understand all the things he was fond of. Farming, hunting, shooting. I couldn't give him the children that he wanted more than anything else in the world. I failed. And as time went by, I only had the memory of those few short years when I was happy. And I knew that if those memories died, everything was dead. And so I, I just wrote them down. 
just as I felt them, that I might always have them. But you describe him as a young man and yourself as old. I was old. But the man who loved me was young. Memories are always young. Are you telling me the truth? Do you believe I am? Now you've seen all these stories, I shall be happy if they have given you as much pleasure to see as they gave me to write. To start, I told you that I had used in my writings pretty well everything that has happened to me in the course of my life. It has been a long one and a varied one. I think I've learnt a little something about human nature, and I've tried to tell what I knew to others as honestly and as truthfully as I could. You, the public, have been very kind to me, but sooner or later we must part. I hope we shall part good friends.